Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz, and with me today is a former BCW World Tag Team Champion and Television Champion, and of course, a two-time TNA X Division Champion, Mr. Petey Williams. Petey, how you doing today, sir? No, oh, how's she going, eh? Uh, I'm, I'm doing good, thank you. So what's going on? What have you been up to? I know Impact is in full swing. Uh, yeah, almost full swing. Still no fans. Uh, which, uh, you know, obviously we film at, uh, you know, the studios down here in Nashville, uh, I commandeered one of the offices, apparently one of our production offices. Um, we're still filming some stuff. We're doing, uh, you know, three days, uh, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, go home Thursday. Um, I know that, uh, I don't know where you're living, but I know in Tennessee, they kind of lifted the, a lot of the mandates and stuff. Um, still no fans for us though. I don't know, uh, if that's going to be something that we do. Uh, shortly or a little bit you know down the road or whatever but I, I i just i think i speak for every wrestler and every wrestling company where uh you know when we say i uh, can't wait for the fans to come back yeah definitely it's weird where i'm i'm in new jersey i'm in asbury park and the, everything is kind of weird with like opening but not schools schools are like wide open all the kids can go to school but everything else like small business stuff it's, it's i don't know it's a weird thing up here yeah, and I, I mean, I, I get it for the kid. I mean, I, I don't want to go have this uh, big whole COVID right. thing, but, I, you know, I know when I, I was a kid, right, you know, I, I don't want to relate this to chicken pox, but I remember chicken pox, like, super mm -hmm. contagious, and, you know, I remember, like, as a kid, you don't get it that bad, um, and I, I know my parents, I didn't get it till I was older. I think it was, like, I got it during, like, WrestleMania, uh, I think, 14. It was the worst pain in my life. Like, I was, I was older. I was a you know, driving and stuff like that, like 16 or 17 or whatever. And it was like the worst pain in my life. But my parents tried really hard to, to have me when I was a kid. Oh, your kid has chicken pox. Okay. I, yep. Come play with my kid, but I never got it. Right. Yep. So I, I kind of understand uh, we want to build up our kids immunities and stuff and, you know, make sure that they're immune to this and whatever the case may be. So the schools, um, I get it. I, you know, I know they're vaccinating the teachers. I have kids of my own and stuff. They're, they're at school and, um they're loving it I, I really think the kids need it yeah absolutely 100 percent. they need that that social environment and you know get out there and and you know if they get sick you know it's okay they can handle it a lot better than you know an older person or an elderly elderly person could handle it yeah no absolutely i i, I agree with you 100 percent um you know it, it's good i obviously we take a lot of precautions here at impact i was just uh you know dennis and i lars and all, the guys on my podcast we were uh, just speaking with uh, John Gresham, like that'll air later. But we were talking about uh, Ring of Honors, um, uh, you know, precautions for COVID and stuff. And man, they 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 go like, like we we get tested. All of us get tested temperatures every day, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I know AEW gets tested and and whatnot. Um, but like these guys, I think they get tested uh, before they even arrive like i guess they get a fedex thing and they have to do it uh like this like on a, on a screen in front yeah. of the doctor and then send it i'm like wow you know and then they they have blocks of timing so it's not all the guys are there at once and they're in the bubble and then they have to get tested prior to going home i'm like that i mean that that's awesome that you're showing that kind of like you know a, a caution and or precaution i should say so um but yeah I'm, I'm glad a lot of companies are doing it and we're uh you know, we've got the masks. Obviously, I have mine off now, so we could do this, so it doesn't right. <laughs> look weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but you know, it's it's COVID. Uh, hopefully, it's uh, it's you know, we things get back to normal soon. So, what are you doing for Impact? I mean, not really on TV much. So, what are you doing behind the scenes? Yeah, uh, you know, I do uh, uh, the the aging, like producing and stuff like that. Um, I was doing that back when I came back in 2017. I came back as an on air talent. Uh, and then it was really weird the way I got my, uh, like Scott Demore, he knew I kind of wanted to get in the production side of it. Um, and even you had mentioned BCW, um, I used to do some agenting stuff for him, uh, when, cause we had our own like local TV show there and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I remember, uh, it was before when uncle Jeff was still like in control of the company, uh, like right before he transitioned, transitioned out. Uh, Scott was one of the agents is, uh, and a writer, and he had, I think, uh, Desmond Xavier and Matt Seidel match. And 
Scott's like, hey, you want a shot at, uh, you know, producing? And I said, yeah, absolutely. When? And he goes, uh, Seidel and uh, Dez, uh, get with them. I'm like, okay, cool. When are they up? He's like, uh, right after this next match. So you got about three minutes. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so, uh, yeah. so it's like sink or swim. But that's been my, with TNA and Impact, like they've, so many times in my career, they just put me on the spot. Um, you know, my first time ever working in TNA, it was, I wasn't even supposed to be in the match. It was supposed to be Teddy Hart, Hubertut Guerrero, and uh, Jerry Lynn. And then uh, we did, uh, that was the weekly pay-per-views. Before the pay-per-view went on the air, we filmed four matches for like the, the X Cup or whatever it was. And Teddy Hart got hurt in one of the matches. And then they're like, yeah, kid, um, you're up uh, first match. Uh, you got 10 minutes to get with Jerry Lynn. It's a three-way. Uh, and you're up. And I'm like, uh, so it. That was my first taste that of, of TNA slash impact. So it's always been that way. And I think that's why, uh, you know, I, I had, you know, s- such a long career here. Cause I know that, um, you know, it, when push comes to shove, I can, I can get the job done. So yeah, to answer your question, uh, mostly, uh, producing, uh, you know, Scott and I have been talking about, obviously, you know, if, you, if, if they need somebody to wrestle or whatever, they'll, they'll utilize me. Um, haven't been doing that yet, so but you know that that could be something in the future as well. I'm not opposed to that at all. I mean, I'm getting old, but I can still go. Yeah, there you go. So you're liking the producing, and it's basically you know the road agent, if you will, right? I mean, it's it's the same thing. They just use a different term. Uh, yes, I guess. Uh, how would I put it? Um, yeah, I mean, we got several producers here. Like one is like uh, you know myself, uh, D'Lo Brown, uh, Tommy Dreamer. Uh, Chris Saban's been doing it as well. And uh, we got Davari. So um, some of us, well, a good majority of us, uh, we wrestle and produce. Um, but that's that's just what we do. And like, you know, a producer, like, and it's kind of weird in this environment too, because A, there's no fans. Um, and we start a lot earlier in the day because we don't have to wait for the crowd to get filled you know seven o'clock show that kind of thing so we'll start at like two or three and you know and we're 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 done right now uh you know we're in central time it's just past uh, nine o'clock ten eastern and we we're we're done filming the in-ring stuff and now we're uh long story but you know our our head like uh guy that does our our uh, produce our promos he lives in denver he got stuck in like this I guess they got like four feet of snow or something. So a yeah, lot of the promos, yeah, they got pushed back to today. Couldn't get them done yesterday. So, you know, it makes for a little bit longer days. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of waiting around and stuff like that. Long TV days, but uh, wouldn't change for the world, man. It is pretty cool, though, that like, let's just not, you know, you're still healthy and still can wrestle, but it's pretty cool to kind of say like, all right, if, you know, if I'm done wrestling, I could do producing, I can do this, I can do that. It's cool to kind of have that backstage role, too, because you're still in the business, you know? Yeah, no, and that's what, and I think every wrestler, uh, I mean, obviously we want to wrestle forever. It just, you know, our bodies can't hold up to it or, you know, you can't perform the way that you used to perform. And it's always, it's always tough to see that where it's like, yeah, I remember watching that guy 20 years ago and man, he was awesome. And then, you know, it looks like he lost the step and, you know, then when you got the, you still got it chance, that's when you just know, like, no, I don't. You're just amazed that I could do something that I used to do. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But I think every wrestler deep down strives to be like, hey, I want to just be involved uh, in the wrestling part of it. So, like, you know, all of us wrestlers love it so much that we would love to do something where we don't have to put our body on the line, but we can also take our knowledge and pass it on to the next generation. I, and I've always been like that. I've never complained about putting anybody over in a match. Or, uh, you know, I remember when um, with this company, I've never really been squashed. Right. But, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when they were uh, bringing in uh, Killer Cross, you know, I was like his his first feud, I guess you could say. And, you know, we really had to build him as like, you know, our, our like a monster, like our next guy. Like he squashed me and I got no qualms about that because, I mean, that was that was my role. We had to get this guy over. And if he beat somebody that is like, you know, can go toe to toe with like the AJ Styles and the Chris Daniels and stuff like that, that I've done in the past. If he beats me like, Oh crap, this guy's the next, you know, and that's just how you build stars and stuff. Yeah. And um, so I think deep down, uh, everybody wants to have that role after they're done wrestling. 
when you produce matches and stuff, I know maybe Demore or Don Callis, I guess they're the, the bosses of the company and stuff. Is it like the Vince thing where it's your fault? Because you, I've had a Hurricane Helms on before. I had Davari on before. And basically, Vince is like looking at them like, what? Why do they do that? And I kind of blame you. Is that the same thing with like Demore? If they do something in the ring that maybe you didn't expect or didn't see and they get mad, is that your fault or is it the wrestler's fault? Um, it, it's either way. So uh, the way it's kind of tough because I see what they're saying about Vince, but that's not just Vince. That's any management, right? Like right. it's not Vince's job. It's not Scott Demore and Don Callis's job to say, to talk to the talent about the matches. It's the producer's job. That's why we have agents. If that wasn't the case, then we can just eliminate this middleman right here. So, you know, it's just like, like a, any sort of, company that's structured like that it doesn't even have to be wrestling but you have the top and then you have your management underneath and then more man and then it goes down so yeah obviously they're gonna ask me since i'm the producer what happened there you know and it's i've never worked for vince i don't know what you know how how, how yeah. bad it gets or anything like that um i the more was the one that trained me and he has no problem telling me like hey you messed up or what happened here and i'm the type of person if it was my fault i'll take 100 percent ownership over it and say like yeah that, that's my fault my bad you know i'm not going to try to hide it or sweep it under the rug that doesn't help me grow it doesn't help the company grow it doesn't help anything so um but you know if it wasn't my fault i'm gonna be like hey that one wasn't my fault like i'll be straight up honest as far as craziness right <laughs> yeah craziness more yeah. filming and stuff don't that's pay attention all to good. that yeah, it's all good. But as far as producing his stuff, you know that they say uh, Pat Patterson was so important with Hogan, you know, with his matches or Brett's matches or Arn Anderson was so important to John Cena matches, stuff like that. Do you think the producer is as important as the wrestler in certain aspects to producing matches? Um, that man, that's a really good and tough question to answer because you want to say yeah because it's a team effort and stuff like that um like i know for example i just had a uh you know a conversation with uh, carl anderson today and i'm like man i have all your your matches again i'm like did you say something to somebody that you wanted me as an agent and he's like dude you, you give good like you know uh ideas and stuff like that and uh, like you know easy to work with and all that kind of stuff so um it's not that we're asking the wrestlers like, hey, who do you want as an agent? I, they have no say. Uh, and we were joking around. But, you know, when I get that feedback from wrestlers where I can actually be part of, you know, the team in a match, I really like that. I try not to step on toes just because I've, I've been in wrestling matches where, you know, in the old TNA days, um, some of the times some of the agents would be like, no, can't do that. You know, and it was an uphill battle. Like, uh, and I, I could tell a story about it or whatever uh, if you want. But. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so uh, back in, it was uh, beginning of January 2005, it was, uh, I don't remember the pay-per-view, like maybe like a final resolution or, uh, I don't know. But it was uh, an X Division title match, and it was an Ultimate X match. It was myself, AJ Styles, uh, and Chris Sabin. And I was the champion, AJ was going over. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, like, really liked that match and stuff. But the finish, I actually had to fight. Like, I came up with this, with this finish, and I had to fight for it with... Uh, with, with Dutch at the time. Um, I can't remember if he was the agent or if I just went to him because, you know, he was uh, Uncle Jeff's, like, you know, right-hand man. But if you remember the finish, me and say like, I hurt AJ's arm earlier in the match. He tries to climb. He can't climb, and he falls down, right? So, oh, AJ, their big top baby face, how's he going to win, right? He can't because he has to climb up there. So then when Saban and I are up there and we're fighting over the belt, he outsmarts us as a baby face would do and springboard up and with his good hand knocks the belt from between us and captures the belt and he wins. Um, which I thought was a really good finish. It told a good story and stuff like that. Um, but Dutch said, oh, you know, it makes AJ look weak. And I'm like, well, I, I can see that a, a little bit, but I'm also, it also makes him look really, really smart that he was able to use other like you know uh, ideas to win the match knowing that you know he was at another disadvantage um but at the end of the day i fought for it like i don't fight for a lot of finishes but i really wanted that one i fought for it and then uh we went through it so you know just being a wrestler myself and when the agents would be like no let's not do that let's not do that i'm like why man like i understand that there's more to the picture uh but i'll only like interject 
and say, no, we can't do that unless I like feel very strongly that we shouldn't do that, like what they're asking to do or, um, you know, that's not, that's not the storyline or the direction that we're going. Gotcha. I've heard of some wrestlers that I've talked to and stuff. It's like, sometimes they come to the building and the producer already has the match like laid out. It's like, here's what you're doing tonight. You're not like that, right? <laughs> no, absolutely not. Um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say, unless they have something particular in mind for the finish or whatever, like, uh, like we, obviously we have a production meeting and then we have an agent's meeting to make sure we're all on the same page. We have a lot of meetings before we, we get there. Um, and a lot of the times with me, I'll go up to the talent and I'll say, hey, I got your match today. And they'll be like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, th- like, there's so many different scenarios. It's just hard to, you know, think like, uh, I'll be like, yep, yeah, you're up, you know, and, and uh, do something like this, you know, and, and make sure in the match you get this in because that's important because what we're the story we're trying to tell is this. So I'll explain why certain things can be done. Other than that, I, I, I trust the, the talent I trust, you know, Scott Demore and, you know, the, the management's decision to put these, you know, certain talent on our TV show in the roles that they're in. Like they, they're here for a reason. It's because, you know, they have the mind for wrestling. They're great athletes, all that kind of stuff. Great wrestlers. I'm not going to try to have them wrestle like the match. I think they should wrestle right or else all the matches are going to look the same in my mind. Right. I'll, I'll throw in ideas and, you know, I think that's why a lot of the times, you know, talent might like me as a producer because I'll be like, oh, let's, you know, top this off of that. And I'll get into it, too, as if I'm because I can't do half the stuff like a Rich Swan can do. But I love producing his matches because Rich can do everything. I can't be doing like, no, like Phoenix or Handspring this and all that kind of stuff. He's such a good athlete. These are ideas that I have that, you know, I would love to do, but I can't physically do them. And that's why I really am the rich, though. Yeah. So. Um, I, I get just as excited as, as the guys when they, then when they work and I'm in the match and, you know, I take great, great pride in it. You get to pick any of the guys you work with. Do I get to pick? No, no. So, um, it, it, it's like, Hey, here's your match. That that's, that's a straight answer. Like this is the match. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, I, I don't know who picks, who produces what match. Um, obviously a lot of the times, well, we will film out of order. If you look at somebody like Chris Saban, who's a producer, as well as like, a, you know, he, he wrestles as well. They have to make sure they space out his stuff so that he doesn't have to, you know, be on headset right before his match and then hurry up and warm up and run right out there and vice versa right. and all that kind of stuff. So we have to be cognizant of that, uh, especially when we do a lot of tapings in one day. Um, but yeah, no, I don't. Us, us producers don't get to say, um, you know, uh, I, I want this match or whatever the case may be. It's kind of like what what's handed to us, maybe our specialty or whatever the case may be. Um, like somebody like Don, like I know when we just had, uh, I think it just aired last Tuesday. Um, they they had the the interview, and I think Scott mentioned the you know Rich Swan versus Kenny Omega kind of deal with the you know Moose and all that kind of stuff. That already aired, and uh, you know Don was like, "Hey, I want PD producing that and and being on headset because that's Don. He'll he'll put it together and produce it because he was he was part of that. But like, you know, he's like, I want I want PD on headset that kind of thing. So, um, he, like, they get to choose that. That it's yeah. their show. Like the producers don't get to choose who they get to work with. Is it weird, like, producing the show, but there's no fans because it's like, wait for this reaction, wait for that reaction. It's like, okay pretend there's a reaction like it, it's got to be like a, a mind fuck i mean it's just weird yeah no uh i agree especially like obviously now what's really helped was uh in the last little bit on our shows were, were uh i think it was right after hard to kill or at hard to kill back in january they started piping in the crowd noise which it, it just everybody knows it's fake because there's no fans but like i think it just helps rather than dead silence you can hear every everything like every foot on the mat like just whatever you can hear the fling of the ropes like just i think that's uh it's tough but you know that that's in post production so when we're wrestling it's like uh you you can still hear a pin drop uh out there like that gets all done in post so it is kind of weird and you don't really know like we're, we're, we're doing something that it goes against what professional wrestling is professional wrestling when i started it you know back in you know the 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 carnival days and stuff like 
we're playing to the people, we're playing to the crowd, we're, we're going off of their emotions and we're giving that emotional roller coaster and stuff. And our next step is going to be based on however the fans react and what's working and what's not and change it up. Well, okay, well now we have a game plan and we're just going to, I don't know, how, you, you, there's no way to feel it anymore. You know what I mean? You just can't yeah. feel it in the ring and like, you don't know, like, did that go? And the only thing I think that gets it, gets the fan or not the fans, the talent through it is just knowing that, okay, we're, we're playing to the cameras now. Um, and part of it, that's what we've always done. Uh, even though we felt the fans, like, you know, Terry Taylor used to say to us, like, hey, listen, don't turn your back to the camera, you know, where all the fans are. Uh, because even though there's like, you know, what, a thousand people behind you, you know, there's potentially millions in front of you. Um, the fans are props. That's what, you know, what they would say. Fans are props. They react. They do, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, which, you know, the fans aren't technically props, but I see what he's saying. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's more of an audience here. This is where our advertisement, our sponsors are and stuff. Uh, the fans are still going to enjoy the show if you have your back to them or whatever. Uh, but that's, that's, it's, it's, it is really tough and I have to give the talent a lot of credit that they're able to go out there and, you know, hustle. And like, there's no crowd behind them when you're like, okay, I got it. I'm, I'm, I'm tired, but I'm going to go through. It's just like, okay, well, there is no crowd. And you just, you just have to remember, uh, there's, there's people here watching and that that's what we're doing it for. Do you think that live shows, let's say maybe a couple months, you think that will go away? Because you know you always hear that, like, oh, WB, we may not run house shows anymore, or they they rather just do it for the TV. You think that's kind of crazy? Like you said, the crowd is so important to wrestling. It just sounds crazy to me. Yeah, I mean, I don't see how W that, that I would think that's a horror. I mean, obviously they have, you know. Uh, a lot of like very educated people doing stuff in WWE when it comes to like, you know, their finances and stuff. But to me, just the common person, uh, just, just thinking like, you know, financially, like that doesn't make sense. I know they get a lot of their gate for the house shows and like they're, that's a big merch and all that kind of stuff. And I don't see how, why they would negate that um, potential revenue coming in. Like that's, that's, I, I, I don't see that happening. I think like maybe, okay, when TVs come back and things start going and, um, what's, what I could see on the house shows, because you look at WrestleMania, I think they said there's going to be what, 40 to 45,000 people there. So half the capacity of there, um, when you run a house show, like let's say you're running at a small arena or even a normal arena that seats like 15, 20,000, normally house shows don't fill 15, 20,000 for a house show. It's like, you know, four or five up to 10, depending on where the market is. Um, but if you look at in the COVID, like if we're still doing the social distancing and stuff, you take that thousand people they would get and then narrow it down to 500. And yeah, I could see how maybe they would go in the red and go in the negative and not get as much revenue. But um, house shows are a big money maker. I don't see why they would ever get rid of that unless they're, you know, concerned about their talent traveling and all that kind of stuff. But uh, if we go back to normal and they lift everything, then I don't see why they wouldn't do that. Yeah, house shows. I mean, that's the best. When I was younger, I mean, you're buying all the merch, you know, you're loving it. That's kind of really, really where you fall in love with the business. That would really stink if they kind of went away from from doing that for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, step one for impact, you know, is to get, uh, you know, fans back in the building. Obviously, fans yeah. back at the show for our TV tapings and stuff like that. Um, TNA, impact now. Uh, you know, before I left, like, I, I obviously took 2020 off. The last time I wrestled was, uh, you know, it was, uh, I guess, Moose in March, but we filmed it in February in Vegas prior to COVID. Um, but I, they were never heavy on the house shows anyways. Like our, our Impact Plus, um, you know, I guess you call them pay-per-views, but our Impact Plus specials, uh, we would always film those like maybe on a house show loop or, or something. Like we might do like an Impact Plus and then, uh, you know, maybe a, a regular, like something else for digital, like a Twitch or whatever the case may be. Uh, so we would do that, but we weren't heavy, like how WWE is where it's like, you know, a couple of house shows, TVs, go back home for three days, do it all over again. So, um, obviously step one fans back in the building, get our TVs, you know, back to the norm pretty much. And then we branch out to do more house shows from there. Now you are not old by any stretch. How come you haven't been wrestling as much? 
dude. I'm that, not old, man. I'll be 40 this year, man. Not that old um, for wrestlers, though. They say wrestlers may start main eventing at 40, you know? Oh, man. Thanks. I, maybe <laughs> I will. Um, no, it, it's not that uh, I don't want to. Again, I haven't wrestled in like 13 months. Um, so it's just tough. Like, I, I can't. Like, obviously, I, I live in like the Detroit area. The school, the wrestling school I usually go to, like I know when I retired in 2014, came back in 2017, uh, you know, I wanted to get some, you know, ring time in because it was three years since I stepped in a ring uh, before I, I came back on Impact. And I, at the time I was, you know, coming back and, and doing House of Hardcore for Tommy Dreamer and stuff. Um, but the wrestling school I would go to is across the border in, in Windsor, like where I train the can wrestling school, Scott Demore, And the borders are closed right now. Um so, and I know there is a, a school down, uh, like, uh, Trey Miguel has one, uh, with this other individual CK three. And I know the machine guns and stuff, they go down there and it's, so it's in Toledo, which is like about 45 minutes away from Detroit. So I can always do that. It's just that, uh, you know, it, it's going to come, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting back into my ring shape. I I'm losing my COVID 10 or whatever you want to call it when, you know, yep. I'm not looking the best. Um, yep. So I, I think it'll be a good year for me. I, I 100% want to step back in the ring uh, soon. And the interesting thing that I wanted to talk to you about, because it, it, I just am like, my mind just boggled by it. So the Canadian Destroyer, great innovation, great finish. So I'm watching AEW and somebody lands two of them. I think it was uh, Matt Jackson lands two of them, one in the ring, one on the floor, no pin, like no, no finish. It's like, it was like a nothing move. Do you have to look at the Canadian Destroyer and you're like, how is that not a finish? Like, first of all, people stealing the move left and right. Everybody does it. What are your thoughts on the Destroyer not only getting stolen so much, but they're not even using it as a finish? Um, yeah, I, I, that, that they should be used as finish. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, not my show, right? AEW's not my show. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's just, it, it's interesting because I remember, um, uh, you know, back before they even allowed it on WWE, you know, uh, before like Adam Cole was doing it and, you know, Rey Mysterio, I think. I think Rey Mysterio was maybe the first one to do it on WWE TV with uh, Andrade. Like, I, I think they did something into the Destroyer. And, and then yep. I saw like, you know, John Morrison take it off the top from the Usos and stuff like that. And then now it's like the norm. But I remember like uh, back, like maybe in 2017, I was just, you know, driving. Uh, Joey Mercury just got, you know, the uh, I don't know if he got released or quit from WWE and uh, we were, you know, going to a Tommy dreamer house, a hardcore show. And I asked him about it. I'm like, so, you know, cause I see a, a, at that point, all like NXT was like, you know, really big and stuff. And they were doing a lot of stuff that like reverse Ronas and stuff like the, um, you would never see it before those, those head type drops and stuff. And I asked Joey, I'm like, what, what do you think? You worked close with like Vince and stuff like that Would the Canadian destroyer ever be possible. And he's like, yeah, you know, you probably just have to call it something else other than a pile driver, like a flipping something else. Um, they're just really against the the, the, the pile drivers there. Um, and then sure enough, you know, a few years later, they're doing it and I see it all the time. And at first I'd be like, hey, man, like it, it was really cool to me the first time Adam Cole did it. And they actually called it the Canadian Destroyer. They ca they called it a springboard Canadian Destroyer off the off the second. Um, and I was like, oh, cool. I should have trademarked that a long time ago. But anyways, um, hmm. And, but then they switched it because they're like, oh, that's not a Canadian Destroyer. That's a, uh, I can't remember what he calls it, a Panama Sunrise. Um, yeah. But yeah, just to see it, everybody, I mean, I've gotten to the point, I'm okay with it. Like, everybody does it so much so that the wrestlers out there actually ruined it for themselves because now nobody wants to see it. And it's gotten to the point where I don't even have to complain anymore. But like, I don't want to see it unless PD's doing it. And I'm like, huh. Okay, cool. You know what I mean? So um, it doesn't matter to me. It, it really doesn't. If they want to do it, do it. Like, you know, when I'm like long dead and everybody listening to this is gone and we have a whole, whole new generation and stuff like that, there's going to be some kid, you know, probably not even born yet that's going to be doing the Canadian Destroyer on TV because I, I don't believe wrestling will ever die. Um, and, you know, I could be like, hey, you know, that, 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 that's the thing that I, I brought to the table. That was the thing that I was able to, you know, get into, you know, on, on TV and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good with that.
it's crazy. Like Dustin Rhodes, who is one of the all-time greats, but he does it. It's like, holy crap, like everyone is taking your move. You don't have any uh, any problem with it, no? No. I, I, I mean, at first, like, you know, I, the my uh, producer on my podcast, uh, Dennis, used to be like, hey, man, you should be more upset about this. And I'm like, hey, don't you talk about how my emotions <laughs> should be. Like, I'm like, it's it's fine. I'm like, I I didn't care that people do it. Uh, I don't like when they switch the name. It's just because, you know, when uh, – I called it the Canadian destroyer. Like I, I did that because, you know, the, the name itself means something to me. Like when I first started indie wrestling, the first ever indie show that I was on, not wrestling, I was still training, but I did, uh, you know, security at the point at the time. Um, Doug Chevalier, the Canadian destroyer was his name. He had just passed away. He's the one that trained, you know, Scott Demore amongst, you know, a, a lot of others like Rhino and stuff like that. And then, you know, Scott trained me. So it's kind of like, you know, paying homage to him. So I wanted to put that name in there to just, you know, Doug's never, really made it anywhere he was an indie wrestler but he was such a great guy and I, I never got a chance to meet him but everybody tells all these stories about him um so I'm like hey this is this is like our you know wrestling lineage kind of like let's let's have this carry on forever so I, I was just more concerned about the name itself the Canadian Destroyer like people are gonna do it and they're not gonna think of Dustin Rhodes or whoever they're gonna they're gonna think of Pete how did you actually create the move? You know what I mean? Like the actual, the flip power bomb. I mean, it, it's crazy. And I remember at the time when I first saw it in TNA, I was like, man, these guys are creating some like amazing moves. But I was like, damn, that's a good finish. Well, uh, the idea came actually, uh, amazing red made it up when he was 11 years old. Apparently, uh, I guess he like recently, uh, maybe last year, or the year before, uh, he put out a, a video online of him doing it, or maybe he was taking it or whatever. Like, I guess Amazing Red created every move you could possibly think of in pro wrestling. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, we were talking about it in the uh, car ride. It was to uh, IWA Mid South show. It was like 2003, and it was like uh, I'm driving, uh, and it was like a four hour drive for us. And you know, Saban's in, in the passenger seat. Uh, Brian Gory, the ref, it's in the back, and Truth Martini's back there too, and they're talking. And they said something about yeah, you know, and then pile driver, you flip. I'm like, wait, what do you mean? And then we were talking about it, but th there, there was no, like, we couldn't pull out a phone back then in 2003 and be like, yeah, look at, like, th there was none of that, right? So yep. you're using your creative imagination, and I, I really can understand him, and I asked Saban, we were supposed to work each other that night, I said, hey, do you want to do it? And he was like, uh, uh, like, where would we put it in the match? Like, we had no idea how it would come out, where you put it in the match, nothing. Like, we're, do we do it as a cutoff? Do we do that? So we ended up scrapping it, and then a month later, I went uh, back to uh, IWM Mid South, and I uh, I didn't go with them. I went with, and I had to work Matt Seidel, and I said, "Hey Matt, I want to try this new move." Um, and he's like, "Okay, what is it?" And I like, "Oh yeah, I just grab you like this, and then I do a front flip land on my butt, and you do a back flip." He goes, "Oh okay," and that was it. Like I didn't know the timing, no nothing, didn't know how it was gonna turn out. Um, it wasn't the finish because like like that was the last move I did, and then I went up top, and then he did whatever and then we finished the match but um that was that was pretty much it that's that's how it came about and then as soon as you know the crowd saw it they went holy you know like this is this is crazy and then right iwa admits i was run by ian rotten and then at that point ian rotten's like kid that was an awesome move and then he just you know strapped the rocket to my back from there and then you know that was that and then i i got to debut it um the hardest part was getting wrestlers comfortable to take the move again i couldn't grab a phone and be like hey look at uh this is how you do it you know so yeah right there was none of that i had to explain it and they're like no you're gonna kill me with that yeah like the toughest part was getting people to trust me and do it it wasn't i it wasn't like i said like oh i have this cool new move i call the diamond cutter where all, all i'm doing is grabbing you i'm gonna fall on my back you're gonna fall on your stomach like everybody be like oh yeah i'm just falling on my stomach okay cool no it's like hey man you know i'm gonna do a front flip you're gonna do a back flip and land on your head potentially kill yourself like all that kind of stuff so the hardest part was getting it into the mainstream, getting people to, to trust it. Um, and I think the turning point was when I had that right before I had my feud with AJ Styles at, at Victor Road, our first like impact or TNA at the time, pay-per-view. Um, we were leading up to it and AJ just said, I think I could take that move. And I was like, okay. And then once AJ took it, everybody was just lining up. Like it was like they were making me like management was booking. It's like, do the Canadian destroyer, do the Canadian destroyer. Like it was like, I didn't have to ask to do it anymore. So I'm like, okay, moves over. I'm good. That's awesome. AJ basically helped get it over. You know, that's pretty great. 
Yeah, like he he was the the first like big like main I guess you could call it like, like their big main star to do it. Like when I when I worked like Juventud Guerrero and uh, like when, when I first did my impact run in uh, early two thousand four, um, Saban like I I wanted to do it to him. He was unsure, you know, because he didn't know me. Like I was nobody at the time and stuff. But you know, he worked Saban a lot. Saban's like, no, you know, the kid's good. You know, we trust him and all that kind of stuff. We didn't end up doing it. That was fine. Uh, and I think it was like the month later or whatever, um, I might've done it to, uh, I don't know. It might've been a, a couple months later where I actually got it on and Saban was the first one to take it on TV. And then that's when they were like, Oh, keep doing it, keep doing it. Um, and then, yeah, once AJ, you know, said, yeah, let's do it. And then we did it on the pay-per-view, uh, you know, where I, where I jumped off the second and did the the one that, that was AJ's idea. Like I, he came up with that. So AJ came up with like the Panama sunrise of it, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, where we jumped down and I'm like, are you sure AJ, it's going to be all you. Like, I can't protect you as much. He's like, I'm fine, dude, let's do it. So yeah, you know, I gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta give props to AJ for, for helping me with that. It's funny, like looking at it, it's like, okay, so many people have copied the diamond cutter and, you know, they do their own version of the cutter or what, you know, whatever it may, may, they may call then like the super kick, you know, who would have thought like Shawn Michaels, main eventer, WrestleMania, you know, like the, uh, that is no longer a finish, but you could never guess Canadians are okay. A flip, basically pile driver. There's no way that's not a finish. And then somehow it's not a finish. It, to me, it's just crazy. Like if you think about it, like, man, they kill every move. Um, yeah, that's that's pro wrestling. But what I always say about, about pro wrestling is like everything's been done, but some things haven't been done enough. Uh, at this point, the Canadian industry has been done enough, though. So, <laughs> yep. <clears throat> and didn't Red though? His was the code red. It was more of like a no, power no, bomb, so though. Yeah, no, he he did the code red. Uh, but he came up. He also came up with the Canadian destroyer. Uh, like unbeknownst to me, like right. He. I I don't know. Like I don't I don't have the video when he was eleven, but he he wouldn't be the one giving it. He'd be the one taking it from whoever. Oh, okay, gotcha. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So, uh, and I remember I, the first time I gave it to Red, I was trying to explain it to him. I'm like, yeah, I, cause I had to. I think I had to beat him for the exhibition title or something or whatever it was, and I said, yeah, and I just do, and he goes, I know, I know, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, how do you know? And he's like, yeah, you know, I used to take it, but and I said, really. He's like, yeah, 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 you know, I know. But he didn't tell me, like, hey, I made that move up, like, 10 years ago. Um, he, Red's not like that. But, yeah, no, he, he – it was just funny. He's like, oh, I know. I'm like, oh, okay. All right, sure. Sorry, buddy. And you did end up beating him for the uh, X Division title, which, you know, really kind of puts you on the map. And he was really – I mean, he was one of their top guys for the X Division. And the X Division was, uh, like, kind of the main reason a lot of people would buy those pay-per-views and stuff earlier in the day. Was that a big moment in your career? I mean, that's was at that point, the X Division was huge, to me anyway, and a lot of the fans' eyes. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the time, I think we had co-champions, Frank Gazarian and uh, Michael Shane. And uh, we were having a gauntlet match, and it came down to – them to me in red and they both got eliminated so that pretty much showed the fans like hey there's going to be a new uh <clears throat> excuse me there's gonna be a new exhibition champion just is it going to be red or is it going to be like red again <clears throat> losing my voice now <laughs> <laughs> or is it going to be Petey? and uh <clears throat> that was the moment where they're like i just found out that day like it was from jerry lynn i think he was agenting the match and he said hey you're gonna do this uh the Scotland match. I'm like, all right, who's going over? He's like, you are. I'm like, <clears throat> is it for the title? And he said, yeah. I'm like, wait, you guys are putting the belt on me. I didn't even have a visa yet. All right. I'm Canadian wrestling yeah. illegally in the U S the visa was in the process. I think that, uh, that date was like August 11th of 04. I didn't get my visa till like August 20th. So I literally had to give the belt to Andrew Thomas, who was a referee at the time producer here at the time now he works for AEW. i had to give him the belt to carry it around because i couldn't bring it across the border um but yeah it was a it was a big point in my career because at the time like i was one of the longest reignings at that time because we were transitioning from you know doing no more weekly pay-per-views to having <clears throat> just a weekly tv show on fox sports net and then the monthly uh pay-per-views with the big one victory road it was all of that was like, man, I had such a good year. I remember like all the promotional posters and stuff like that had like, um, 
you know, AG on it and Jeff Jarrett. And I don't remember if like it was Nash or something, but Monty Brown and stuff. And I'm wrestling AJ and I'm like, well, obviously AJ is going to beat me. He's their poster boy, but they end up having me beat AJ. And I was like, it, it was, it was, it was pretty crazy that, that, that few months, that, that year for me, uh, my career. So. Yeah, it really put you on the map. Not only the, the destroyer, but then putting the X title on you. I mean, really put you on the map and kind of says like, wow, this X division not only, you know, has AJ Styles and all these other great guys, but wow, this guy Petey Williams, holy shit, look at this guy. He's he's got something. So it was really kind of a, a interesting time in in TNA just because the X division was really the the main focus for a, a while. Yeah, and a lot of times like <clears throat> you're really hard as on yourself as a wrestler cuz I'm like did I help ruin the X division? Cause at one point we went from here to here, you know, then back up. Like it was always on a roller coaster. And I'm like, and I always look at like myself. I'm like, Oh, did I help ruin it? I don't think so. But sometimes I think of like, I was the one that, I mean, I don't know where I'm going with it, but I always think of the back of my mind. I'm like, okay, well I didn't do as much flashing high flying stuff as a lot of these guys. And I'm like, I, I did the Canadian destroyer. That was that. But, it just seems like some you're your own worst enemy, you're like your own worst critic. Like, did I not do enough as a champion? That's what I think sometimes. <laughs> do you think Man. that like the uh, X division itself, do you think that was kind of like a game changer for wrestling? Because now so many guys kind of implemented that style. Yeah, I, I really do. I think um, what you see in the X division from like, the early 2000s that's pretty much what you're seeing on any other television show out there when it comes to wrestling so yeah uh, i really do think it revolutionized how wrestling is like it, it's uh, that that old school type match like i still love watching and stuff like that um but those are gone i mean you, you don't see any of those anymore so yeah i definitely think that uh that that the X division really brought wrestling what it is today. Whether you feel that it helped, like, you know, kind of killed wrestling or not, um, it, it brought wrestling where it is today. <clears throat> the athleticism, you know, back then is crazy now. I mean, I feel like it's even more crazy. Do you think that the psychology is lacking in today's wrestling? Because you can mix in the athleticism, but maybe it's missing the selling and the psychology a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I would agree, but the way that it was kind of described to me back in the X Division days, X Division, if you look at them like cruiserweights, if you relate it to boxing, so you, you got guys like, you know, Mayweather and stuff who are not heavyweights, right? But they, they can, like, him and Delahoye can, like, hit each other in the face multiple times without going down, and they're still going, and they'll go, like, the, the 12, 15 rounds, whatever they do now. Okay, cool. But the heavyweight matches... <coughs> You got Mike Tyson or whatever. His match are lasting a couple times because you get hit one good pop with him. He's done. That's how they kind of related it to the X Division. Like, hey, we're lighter. We don't have as much force around our hits and stuff like that. So we can kind of brush them off a little bit more. I I think it's just us trying to like, you know. Sorry. All right. Getting kicked out of the (laughs) office in a second. I I think it's us just trying to justify like, hey, we're kind of cruiserweights look at like other sports and like UFC and boxing cruiserweights and look how the heavyweights are. It's faster. We hit more, not harder, but more as opposed to the heavyweights. Gotcha. Now, uh, I guess we'll wind it down. We'll hit the finish. Cause I don't want you to get uh, kicked out of the office there. Oh, he's fine. Uh, no. Oh, okay. I was going to mention uh little PD pump or, you know, little Papa pump uh, at one point. That was great. Cause you know, that's not really X division, but you're kind of separating yourself with Scott Steiner. What was it like working with that man? Oh man, it was actually great. Uh, I got along with Scotty uh, very well. Don't know why he took a liking to me. Um, I don't know if like, you know, Scott has a reputation back in the WCW days of being a bully. A lot of the guys were afraid of him and stuff like that. I don't know, like, you know, he got a little older and maybe he calmed down a little bit. I, I don't know. But, like, first day he was trying to bully me and I was just, like, shut him down or whatever. And I don't know if <clears throat> that, like, earned his respect or <clears throat> the fact that I work out and stuff like that. He re- He's like a body guy, you know. Uh, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's because I always looked out for him and stuff. Um, but we got along very well. We did a lot of fun and stupid things. I, you know, I was getting shot in the back with paintball gun bareback and 
riding on the hood of his car. He's a crazy driver, by the way. Um, yeah. And, you know, we, what else? Like, we, we couldn't do the waterboarding because that's not good. But, you know, he tried drowning me one time, all this kind of stuff, shaved my head. But it was great. I loved it. Um, did a lot of cool things and got to work with, like, you know, Angle and Joe and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and out of that came one of the best promos in wrestling history, the math promo. And yep. I, I thought I thought it was a good mix, you know. So I got to thank Vince Russo for that because it was his genius idea that, you know, I started off as, like, this maple leaf muscle. And then he was like, oh, I can see you and Scotty doing something. And then they just kind of, you know, pushed it that way. And I, man, I had a great time. And I still talk to Scott and I see him and, um, you know, he's still the, the same crazy guy. How did you not break during that promo? How did you <laughs> not start, you know, like dying laughing from that? I did break. If you rewatch it, um, it was one take, believe it or not. And I'm sitting there like this and we're, you know, he's giving his promo and stuff. And then the mask start to my mind, didn't start making sense. And I had my glasses <laughs> on and my chain mail. Yeah. And I pretty much just look at the camera like, oh, okay, I guess they're not going to call cut. We're going to still film. And, like, so I did break. Like, at one point, like, I'm like, this is stupid. Like, real Vince, you're not going to call cut? No? Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's keep going. So it's good I had my glasses on and was covered up. But, no, I did not because I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, this doesn't even make sense. Uh, but, it, you know, I mean, what do I know, I guess? Because, I mean, one of the – it still lives up to this day as one of the greatest promos ever. And it fits his character. It's like, okay, he's just nuts. You know what I mean? Well, like, yeah, he's just and that's, that's the thing. Like, um, there'd be times, not that promo, but where, uh, you know, Scotty would be in character and, you know, stumbling over words like he does. And he'd be like, ah, get, get cut, do it again. And, like, Vince would get upset. And would be like, no, bro, no, why? He's like, I stumbled over that word. He's like, it's okay. That's your gimmick. You have so much pent-up frustration that you don't – sometimes you don't even pronounce your words correctly. And yep. he's like, that's great. And like, he tried to <clears throat> push that in Scott's head. And I think that's why you saw the Scott Steiner at the end of like, you know, his run with impact. It was different than the run he got from WCW because Vince helped his character as like a lot of people don't think so, but he did because he kept saying like, no dude, like, listen to me like this. It's okay. If you stumble over words and then we get like YouTube stuff on YouTube, like Scott Steiner versus the English language, but, and we get a lot of comedy out of that, but you know, that was, that was Vince pushing that. Like, no, it, it's okay. Like, a, it's funny to some people that at the same time, it makes sense. Like he's just like, and he can't even say his words. So I get it. I loved it. Um, and we tried to do everything in one take, uh, but it didn't always work out that way. I asked Russo too, because I said, how did you produce that segment? How'd you write that? Like, how'd you create that? So interesting. He said, I had nothing to do with it. I stood there and I didn't tell him to stop. He just went <laughs> and he goes, that he goes, that was all him. So I was like, man, like what a creative uh, random See, and, promo. And that's the thing. So I also heard that, uh, I, I did hear that Russo and this is year, this is like probably only a couple of years ago. Um, probably in like 2017, somebody told me it's probably totally wrong because it's like 15 years after the fact or however long uh, that Russo wrote the math promo. Hmm. But if Russo saying that he didn't, I, I, so no, I don't know what's yeah. true. So <clears throat> in 2017, I had to wrestle Matt Seidel and Steiner <clears throat> just won the, or was about to win, or maybe he did win. He teamed up with Eli Drake for the tag titles and he came in and I asked him, I said, why don't you bust my promo? and uh, do some math and stuff and he's like like he's like what do you want me to do and i'm like i just make up some math stuff he's like no it's got to make sense and i'm like <laughs> what it's got to make sense the no, math got, no he said no he said yeah. the math's got to add up and i'm like add up like what <laughs> so um I, so I, I that's why it was i really don't know what to believe i'm like did russo mm. write it mm. did scott write it like i don't know but usually Russo never wrote anything for Scott. It was always coming out of Scott's, uh, you know, mind. So I believe yep. that it was Scott doing that promo. Yeah, he said. Russo told me he said he said no, that was all Scott. He's like, I wish I could take credit for it because because it's like a work of art. It's like a genius that he said that because it's so funny. You know, Samoa Joe, you fat piece of crab, and you know, blah blah mm -hmm. blah. And then he starts going with the math, the thirty three and a third, like <laughs> yeah, just one hundred forty one and two thirds percent chance. I'm like, yeah. you can't. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, that's so great. What's interesting though with Steiner after his WB run, people are like, "Oh, he, you know, his leg injury. He had that bad foot injury. Oh, he must be done." And then all of a sudden, he's working with you and Samoa Joe, and everyone's like, "Okay, what happened to WB? Like, you know, maybe he is healthy. Maybe he is good." So you had like a great match with him and kind of put him back on on the right path. Um, I mean, you know, he's easy to work with, and you know, he he does have a whole slew of injuries, like. We were doing a Chikara show. We did, just did me, Jordan Grayson, uh, Steiner, and this is at the end of 2019 where we did the King of Trios. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like, uh, I remember, like, you know, he was winded and stuff. And I had you know, one of the people that worked there was like a paramedic or whatever. Nothing serious. But, you know, I said, hey, can you just check on Scotty? I'm like, he, he, he's not usually like this after his match. And she did. And, you know, he's like, yeah, he's fine. But I remember him saying, like, she asked, like, do you have any injuries or have any prior injuries and he says i've had everything injured except for i can't remember if it was his left or right he said my left my left ankle that's the only thing i've injured in my life and i'm like jeez so he's had a lot of injuries um even you know at one point during my exhibition title run i want to say yeah he he tore his acl completely and he was out for a while um and that's right before the main event mafia thing so it, it's interesting I wonder how long our run would have been had he not gotten injured, you know, because that kind of put the end to it. So um, a lot of this stuff I think about, like, oh, I wonder how things could have been different. But Scott will bump, man, and he's a good bumper, and he had no problem, like, you know, bumping for us smaller guys and stuff. I don't know if it was the same way in WCW. I don't know if, like, you know, later on in his career, uh, he, he needed to be like, hey, I can still go in the ring. <clears throat> But, you know, he was always really generous to me, and I, I had no, no problem working with him. I actually really enjoyed working with him. You always hear funny stories of him, like in WCW, trying to drown Disco Inferno, <laughs> trying to uh, Who you know, beat up. want to guy. drown Disco Inferno, though, man? <laughs> Come on. Well, I, Disco kind of tells a story where he wasn't really trying to drown him, but he he has attempted to do it to several people. <laughs> Basically, they're on the jet ski. He knocks him off the jet ski, and then he sprays the water. He keeps going around so he can't get back to the jet ski. So kind of oh. sort of trying to drown him. I, I mean, I uh, guess, but okay. I would have done the same thing to Disco. So, I mean, I, you can't really hold that against Scott. No, yeah, that's true. Not. True. Then you always hear, like, you know, he... he uh, basically like um, took DDP's clothes off and like try to throw them in front of fans, you know, in the locker room, just to like all these like people, Oh, he's bullying. But to me, it's, it's like with a sense of comedy, you know what I mean? He's just being funny. Like it's, you know, tying somebody up and then like, you know, fake beating them up or like uh, they used to play with Mysterio and his mask and stuff. And I don't know, to me, like it's more comedy than, than Oh, come on. He's bullying people. It's just him being yeah. kind of silly. Yeah, and I mean, stuff. yeah, and we used to do all that stuff. Like in my first run, all the sex division guys, you know, like used to hang out together. Like you know, myself, Sanjay, Sabe, and Shelly, uh, you know, Creed, or, uh, like Xavier Woods, uh, you know, Jimmy Rave. Even we had A One with us and stuff. We were all Jay Lethal. We'd always hang out as a bunch, and we would do all that silly, stupid stuff all the time. Like just trying to rib each other. Like one time. Uh, A1 and, and Shelly, like, uh, me and Sabo were rooming together, and they flipped our box springs and our mattresses in our hotel room and then remade the beds. Um, <laughs> you know, so when it came time, like, oh, this is a nice good day, and then we, it's like, oh, why is this bed so, you know, yeah, like, I yeah. mean, we would do all sorts of stupid stuff like that, but it was just, you know, we're with each other every single week for multiple days. You, 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 you just got it. It's like we're brothers, and that's what, you know, brothers do to each other. Yeah, you got to have a little fun on the road. You know, you're going to get bored and you got to spend so much time together. You got to, you know, lighten the mood a little bit. Exactly. And I mean, ah, man, I, I wish I could just remember like more, you know, stories and stuff like that. But I, like we always talk about it. Like I always run into A1 who's like, you know, semi-retired, you know, still does some stuff. He looks great and stuff like that. But I'll, I'll see him on the Indies prior to COVID. And, you know, we, we always talk about like, man, the best years of our life. We're that, we're that, you know, couple of years when we we're, you know, always going to Florida every week. Like, it's awesome. Like us dudes from Canada, we get to fly to Florida every single week. It's like a dream and like get to hang out and do the coolest job. And like, it was just awesome. Like we love to hang out with cool people and do all these things. Like just a, a kid's dream come true. So we always look back on that and we always talk about be like, man, remember that time? Remember that time? Like those were definitely the best years of our life. 
That is great. And what's kind of like, I know it's like a generic thing, but what's like some of your favorite matches in TNA for the X division? Just cause I know I love that. you like, somebody says to them, Oh, I'm going to go check it out on YouTube or so, or, you know, the impact plus app or something. You go, go check it out. Do you have some matches that stick out to you from impact? Uh, obviously, you know, uh, of my own, um, you know, Obviously, the myself, uh, AJ, and Chris Sabin in that. Uh, I want to say it was called Final Resolution. Uh, I want to say it was called Final Resolution 2005. That Ultimate X match. That that one, I, I really enjoyed. Um, you know, it's funny because uh, I remember Sanjay used to get all the dirt sheets back when you had to get them mailed and you read them. You know what I mean? <laughs> and I remember I'm like, oh, let me see that, and because they 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 rated our match, and you know they rated it high, whatever. They were like, oh, you know, word is that they've been planning this match for several weeks before. And I'm like, wow, that's so horseshit. Because I remember we couldn't find AJ that day. Like, I don't know if he was doing other pre tape stuff. Like, where's AJ? We need to put this match together. The sh- you know, show's about to start. So there was no, like, weeks. Pre- like, we came up with that stuff that day. So um, that that's one of them. And then uh, even the month before, in, uh, I want to say it was Turning Point 2004, myself for Saban. Uh, everybody forgets that match. We had... Such a good match, horrible finish, but whatever, because it was brass knuckles. But um, we had such a good match. I really enjoyed that match. Uh, it was really overshadowed because that was the same pay per view where like Elix Skipper, uh, Elix Skipper walked the top of the cage oh, yeah. and did that yeah. Rana. So obviously everybody remembers that. They remember the match Saban and I had. Um, I'm trying to think of like later on in my career. Uh, oh, oh, myself and Frank Gazarian um, for the X Division title. It was. Slammiversary. I don't remember what year. I think it was 07 or it might have been 08, but I, I really enjoyed that match. I remember, uh, you know, we, we were kind of like getting close to our not hitting our time, going over our time. So we were kind of rushing a couple things. And I remember Uncle Jeff was like, hey, you got to hold that sharpshooter for longer. And when he was bleeding and stuff like that tells a story. I'm like, yeah, but we were like, you know, we were trying to get to the to we, we, we needed to go home. We were here and he was like, no, don't do that. And I'm like, what? I, we would have gotten so much trouble if we would have <laughs> went over time, you know? Um, and then a couple of, like, nostalgic things I really like is um, we had a pay-per-view in uh, in Canada, in Toronto. It was, like, it was like our first pay-per-view, really, outside of uh, the U.S. And it was myself versus, uh, you know, Xavier Woods versus Davari. And I remember our time got cut a little bit. I was kind of irked about that, but... It was just really amazing that, you know, I was I was a heel this whole time. And then, you know, you walk out that arena in Canada and it was like the, the reception. I, I just I couldn't believe it. Like, I was like, wow. And there's like signs that say, like, you know, PD for president. If PD loses, we riot and stuff like that. And I just say uh, you got like 5000 people going nuts. I'm like, wow, this is really surreal. Like, I mean, I don't remember much of the match, but just moments like that. And then mm-hmm. even when uh, we had I think it was Bound for Glory 2017. Uh, you know, we were in Ottawa and I, I just remember the whole, like I come out to the Canadian national anthem and like just, we had a six way match and um, you know, I, I made the entrance and people are just singing the national anthem with me. And it was just like, and even Sanjay, who was, you know, a writer at the time, but also in the match, he was like, Oh, this is so effing awesome. Pete, this is incredible. Like he, like he was having a good time too. Just the energy of the crowd. So um, I, I more remember that energy of the crowd rather than like the, the match itself because i've had awesome matches that were never televised in front of 20 people as well you know so yep. um those are just a, a couple that i remember off the top of my head is there any matches that you're looking to have like you said you want to return you want to get back in the ring is there anybody you're looking to wrestle and maybe ace austin something like that or well, I've somebody else ace austin uh like a couple times already uh you know, a few years ago when I was, when I was still wrestling with him, when he was up and coming, like, I think I was like his, his first little feud to actually put him like, you know, elevate him to the next level and the, the levels he did at now. But yeah, I'd love to, you know, go at it with him again. Um, even like, you know, uh, Rohit, I like what he's doing now. Um, and, you know, I'd like to get in the ring with, uh, you know, some of the AEW guys good too. Like I haven't worked Kenny Omega in like, since 2004 well wow maybe so and i mean we reminisced a little bit when he came at uh i think it was hard to kill maybe um i think in january or something you know and we reminisced about that and he was very thankful because at the time i was exhibition champion the thing that sucks is it was it wasn't recorded it was like this nwa anniversary show 
and and me and Kenny, I I think we're the main, and he was like the new up and coming, like, you know, next big thing. And, uh, you know, he, he still this many years later, thanked me for that. Cause he was like, man, I, you didn't need to have that type of match with me and give me so much offense and stuff like that. But I really appreciate it. And I'm like, dude, I've always wanted to pay it forward. Cause I used to hate getting in the ring with somebody that's like, you know, I used to like watch on TV or whatever the case may be. And they didn't want to do anything. But I remember like, like one of the first big names I worked with was Jerry Lynn and Jerry Lynn wasn't like that. He would go out there and he would have the Jerry Lynn awesome match that he has. So I always appreciated that, that Jerry Lynn did that to me. And I said, I want to be like that. And I want to be that guy that pays it forward rather than be like, oh, I'm just going to phone it in today and earn my paycheck. So, um, you know, and I, I think that's, I think that's what wrestlers should always strive to do, not just, you know, phone it in. But that's just, that's just me. True, very true. And that's pretty cool, uh, Ken Omega. Is, obviously, you're, you guys are going to remember that stuff, but that's pretty cool that you get to kind of do that because now AEW is kind of working with Impact and Impact is kind of working with AEW. So that's an interesting thing for uh, wrestling. NWA is kind of sprinkled in a little bit with everybody. It's I don't know, it's a different world in wrestling. You would never see WCW and WWF you know, teaming up or something like that. So it's weird to see, right? Or, or is this like a good thing? Is this like a, a new thing for wrestling that, that all these companies are working together? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's been done before. Just actually, we're acknowledging it. Um, you know, like ECW was in cahoots with WWE back in the day, sure. and like yeah. you know, WC, like all this kind of stuff. Um, I think we're just like actually putting a name on it now, like the Forbidden Door and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a little bit different. I like it though. I think you know, for 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 many 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 years, it was always WWE, and then when TNA was coming up and Ring of Honor, they're always fighting for like maybe who's second best or whatever. Um, and then you have AEW, you know, rising up. And then you still have, like, the Ring of Honor, TNA, like, all this kind of stuff. New Japan jumped in there. And I think maybe – I don't know if all the companies got smart and were like, hey, man, we should stop fighting each other and work together <laughs> because right. I think we'll make more of an impact uh, if if we go at this. And I don't think we're trying to overtake WWE or anything like that. Uh, it's just like, you know, I think – we can share viewers and, you know, share all that stuff rather than trying to fight for them and, you know, go head to head on the same night and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think it's a very smart business move. Um, I don't know how smart I, I always wonder, like, I'm not privy to all the conversations that happen, but, you know, obviously you got Tony Khan that runs AEW, you got, you know, Scott and Don over at uh, Impact, uh, you know, Sinclair over at uh, Ring of Honor, you know, what, and you got New Japan, but, it makes me wonder like how those conversations go when it's like, yeah, you know, we'll have Kenny Omega versus rich title versus title. Okay. Who's winning. Right. Yeah. You, you yeah. know what I mean? So that's interesting to me. And I think, I mean, I don't even know if they planned that far. Maybe they have, you know, like, I mean, so even like I've always been a wrestling fan, so I'm even excited and I work for the company, you know what I mean? So I, I got to think that the wrestling fans are also super excited. So um, that, that's how you know something's working when you have somebody that actually works for the company being excited about, you know, what's going to happen next. Um, that, that's when, you know, okay, you know, the, the fans are in for a treat. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We, and we don't know. He's the Kenny Omega's trying to be the belt collector. and Rich Swan is becoming a bit of a belt collector himself. So who's going to win? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Rebellion, uh, in April, that should be a pretty good match, pretty good pay-per-view. And I like that, uh, impact is, you know, keeping their name out there. They, like you said, you got the shirt, the good brothers, you know, they're on imp or, uh, uh, dynamite every week and impact every week. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I don't know. I just happen to be wearing this today. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah no i gotta thank the good brothers for you know the nice merch uh collar elbow uh they also hooked me up with merch too um and then uh yeah and also you know since we're on here uh doing a podcast you know myself i'm sure i i know you you've talked to dennis dennis the yep. producer of uh our podcast it's uh the wrestling perspective uh you know we're on we're on fight tv on youtube anywhere you get podcasts uh, we have a awesome like group of guys uh yeah, very crazy. Original. i don't yeah. think it's been done before but you know myself dennis we got uh four-time stanley cup champion darren mccarty uh from the detroit red wings we got uh you know major league uh you know baseball player uh Dimitri young uh you know used to play for the tigers and a bunch of other teams jason kendall uh i can't talk about him because i don't want to give away any information but we got uh him on there potentially maybe not and i said too much okay and then uh, <laughs> uh lars <laughs> Lars Fredrickson from uh, the lead singer or one of the singers from Ranted and 
it's just i'm like wow how do you get this group of guys and we all just love talking wrestling just like we're talking right now and just you know doing interviews and we don't always do interviews but we just we we talk and shoot the breeze and fantasy book and maybe do sweet 16s and all this kind of stuff just because we like watching wrestling and i think it right now it's a, a really great time to be a wrestling fan yeah and the wrestling perspective podcast is crazy because you think about it, you get all those guys from all these different genres but they're all so successful in those genres but they love wrestling you guys all yeah. love the business and a lot of the times what they'll do is they'll relate it like, you know, Lars will say like, oh, you know, when I used to, you know, travel here in Japan and do this and, you know, they can relate their traveling, their business, you know, because they've been at the top of their business to like wrestling as well. Not in the same way, but it's really interesting how the dynamics of a show or the dynamics of an event or something, how they're all very similar and, you know, the politics, all that kind of stuff. Um, I got to move out of the way. I think I'm getting booted out of this office. So, uh, uh, so yeah, that's, that's always very interesting to me. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Did, before we let you go, let's just, uh, give your uh, social media plugs and uh, get that out there. Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter or, uh, Instagram at, uh, IPD Williams. Uh, obviously you can follow us, uh, the wrestling perspective on YouTube, I, I think we air on Fight TV uh, every Monday and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, what else? I, th- I, th- I think that's it. And then obviously you can find our podcast on any other like outlet that you usually normally get your podcast. All right. Awesome stuff. Petey, thank you so much. Appreciate all time and get yeah. back to work. You guys got, you got uh, some yeah, work to do. I know I do. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I appreciate it. You guys are you're doing a, a awesome, phenomenal job too. So um just thank you for having me thank you appreciate it and uh, good luck with impact all right thanks